Good day, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. This webinar series, The Ecosystem of Academic Publishing, is brought to you by IES Research, a team that provides research communication with an engaging voice. My name is Wei Fu Wong, and I'm your host for today. This webinar is the fifth section of the series, and with us today is Dave Kochako from Artifact, the United States. Dave Kochako, co-founder of Artifacts, has 30 years of experience in the SDM industry, leading startup, multinational businesses, and non-profit organization. Upon joining Eugene Garfield at the Institute for Scientific Information, or famously known as ISI, in the early 90s, and throughout his tenure with Thomson Reuters, Dave led the development and growth of world-class scientific research solution, including Durban, EndNote, Insight, Scholar One, and of course, the Web of Science, among others. Dave is a co-founder of ORCID, and he served as a consulting advisor and board member for industry and academic institution. Today, his topic is research data, add value, and authority for academic publishers. This sharing will be approximately 20 minutes, and we will have the remaining time for Q&A. Please feel free to ask any question throughout the session by simply using the Q&A toolbar located at the bottom center of the Zoom meeting interface. So without further ado, let us welcome Dave Kuchako. Dave, over to you. Oh, Wei Fu, thank you very much for this opportunity and thank IES Research for the, uh, the opportunity to speak today with, with all of you. Um, as Wei Fu explained, my topic is, it, today is to, is to speak about research data and how it adds value and authority for academic publishers, really for all participants in this research ecosystem, whether they, they are the creators of research, the faculty and research staff at universities, at research institutes, or at governmental agencies, or the consumers of, of scientific and scholarly research. Really, from an artifacts perspective, the greatest value that we all can be adding in terms of scientific and scholarly accomplishment, as well as societal benefit, focuses around research data. So before I, uh, when, well, when Wei Fu asked me to speak on this topic, I thought, well, let me, let me review again what publishers, specifically academic publishers, have to say in, collectively speaking, in their mission statements. And so I sourced, oh, from about 18 to 20 different publishers uh, and uh, pulled the text from the material from their home pages, representing how they position and describe themselves to the world, to the research community, uh, and generated uh, what I think is really quite a thoughtful and relevant word cloud where you know, the words that just literally jump off the page are authoritative, research data, impactful, valuable, but research material is there, supplementary research, open access, and many other relevant, relevant terms. And so I thought it's a very poignant and relevant starting point for, for this discussion. So why from an artifacts perspective is focusing on research data more important than ever? Well, there are really some, some major external drivers of this, the greater significance of research information, of research data. First, policy mandates and requirements. Government agencies, funders of research are increasingly not only expecting the access and availability of the evidence of research that supports publications, as an example, but they're putting further incentives as well as compliance requirements into the funding dollars that they award. Secondly, behavioral changes. Uh, that we're seeing across the globe literally in real time here uh, as societal crises prioritize data access. And there's none more, more relevant and, and, and in front of us daily than the globe's, the global research infrastructure that is tasked with finding solutions 
therapies and vaccines to deal with the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus and, and, and COVID-19, the disease. And thirdly, challenges from society for open and authoritative sources. Increasingly, we are seeing from all across the general public, the, um, the educational sector, the expectation from society that, that science be able to confirm and substantiate its claims in ways so that it can continue to be relied on as a trusted, as a trusted source. Now, those are external drivers. What publishers control is the opportunity, frankly, because there are vast volumes of non-curated research data that remain disconnected from published works. And importantly, there are affordable solutions for, for competing in the marketplace and certainly competing with large, well-funded publishers. So why artifacts? Well, research material grows daily by an estimate of 90 billion gigabytes, and that's when the Hadron Collider is not in operation. 85% of that research output, however, is not indexed. And as a result, too much valuable research remains hidden from view. If the material isn't curated and indexed or indexable, it's almost impossible to find. It's nearly impossible to find unless you happen to know the researcher or the research team that produced the data files. Authors themselves struggle to gain recognition because their works can't be found, reused, or cited. And publishers sit in the very essential focal point in this ecosystem where they are the most credible source for trusted content. So what, is, what, what Artifacts does, it helps authors and publishers get their work discovered and cited. It provides secure and transparent mechanism for the global registration and attribution of research. And we do this by transacting records directly onto the Blocksburg blockchain. The Blocksburg blockchain is operated, founded by the Max Planck Society and operated by nearly 40 world-class research institutions across the globe. And thirdly, what Artifacts does, is it, it offers the authority, the value and authority across three important areas. It enables research data to be secured and maintained in terms of its provenance. In other words, chaining together the evolution of research files as they evolve over time to enable the creators of the research outputs to connect them with their publications, to add value to publications. And thirdly, to enable formal recognition for any research output at any time to boost the discovery and citation impact of the producers of that science, of that research, as well as the publishers of those work products. Well, how does this work? Well, in three simple phases, publishers, add new publications to the artifact system, and they invite new authors that they've published to join and participate. The authors themselves have the opportunity to link their research files with the publisher and the journal dashboards that artifacts hosts for those publishers. And those authors, those researchers, as their research continues over time, are able to continue adding data after publication. So from a, from a publisher's perspective, now we begin to see and feel how a publication, an article, if you will, is no longer fixed in time, but it's very much a dynamic living value for your subscribers and your readership. And it modifies over time as your authors are able to augment the content of works that you've already published. Now, thirdly, the third step in the process is where Artifact steps in, where we add some additional author metadata to add intelligence to these records. We post proof of existence transactions onto the Blocksburg blockchain. We update the publisher dashboards. We support the publishers. And simultaneously, we update the dashboards and the profiles of the individual researchers that have created these works. So I'll, in the interest of time, what I thought I would do here, and hopefully we, we have some time toward the tail end uh, during the Q&A, we'll see. 
But in the interest of time, what I thought I would do is focus on a few screenshots to give you a, an idea of what Artifacts looks like and how it operates. Um, the landing page here, I'm, in, in this case, I, I, I'm the logged in user. The landing page shows at the upper portion of it a, a number of public dashboards. These are dashboards that we have custom created for the publisher customers of Artifacts. And we'll, uh, I'll show some illustrations as we drill into these uh, in a moment. Also in this display is a, is a rotating set of newly added artifacts or published research. So these could be unpublished research documents that have come into the system or even published works that have come into the system through, uh, through the ac actions of our users, as well as our own addition of content into the system. The way to think of artifacts is not as a as an index, uh, an historical index, such as the Web of Science that has over a hundred years depth of content. The Web of Science is a wonderful resource. It's a treasure trove of research information. The way to think about artifacts is that we are laser focused on the research that's produced today, yesterday, and importantly, much of which is unpublished, meaning it hasn't been able to be easily discovered before. And as we'll see in a moment, because it can't be discovered, it couldn't be cited until artifacts. And in the lower portion of this display, we see uh, some authors that again, have added, uh, had their works added into the system. On the left-hand side of the page is the navigation panel, where the user can always return to this landing page by clicking on the artifact logo. The user who's currently using the system has their own profile information behind, behind this display. Then these links for dashboard provide a view to a public view to anyone who has access to the artifact system to see what my activity on the system, how it appears. It's an area where I can actually uh, access my own artifacts, files and data and such that I'm working with workspaces that the system allows me to structure, which is a mechanism, it's a, it's, a, it's a vehicle for collaborating with research teams, participating in various roles. I might be a principal investigator on one project, or I might on a different work, uh, workspace project, I might be a statistician, or I could be uh, an evaluator uh, and such. And then of course, uh, search capability. Now moving on here to provide a glimpse of one of the publisher dashboards, I'm, sh I'm showing the Journal for British Blockchain Association's uh, public dashboard. And what you see here is a quick summary of the total proofs of existence that's contained uh, for this dashboard. Now that would include certainly accumulation of all of their published works. It also would include any supplementary files any research data files that their authors have added into the system where artifacts automatically ex executes a proof of existence transaction. And as that activity comes into the system, these counts continue to increase. But also importantly and different for artifacts um, is the nature of citations. Yes, of course, resources like Google Scholar, Web of Science, Dimensions, or others track historical citations to the published literature. And as I said before, they do that very well. What Artifacts does uniquely is to enable citations to be given, received, and tracked and reported in real time to works that don't even have to be published. And I'll show in a moment how that's done. I spoke of provenance and in the, in the, in the art world, provenance is a very commonly used term that is, that is used where the owners of art or the prospective owners and investors in art are very keen to understand, am I looking at the original? How do I know that this is the original? Well, in science, it's much the same. And the way in artifacts, you know that you're looking at the original or as we know that research evolves over time, research files evolve over time, a painting may have evolved over time, but it's a, it's a static finished product. But in research, it's different. 
Well, what Artifacts does is it chains together the provenance every time there is a significant change to the file and or its metadata. So what you see here is the history of this provenance chain. So if you happen to be an interested party wanting to reuse these data, you can not only be assured of the creator, but you can see the file, the information as it evolved over time. So you have that assurance. And when you have that assurance, the creators of this work also have the incentive and the security and the willingness to share their research earlier. Now here, what I show is within a workspace. Now I mentioned a workspace earlier as, a, as a, an, an area within which uh, I can participate with a team. I might lead a team, I might be a member of a team. And there's no limit on the number of workspace, uh, workspaces that users can create. From a workspace, however, what's uniquely different about artifacts is you can make a citation. Now we've all seen how products such as EndNote allow an author who's writing a manuscript to drop a citation into their, uh, into their manuscript. And that's a wonderful tool. Very, it's, a, it's a wonderful productivity tool. But in this environment, where those of us on, on this research project may be working in a laboratory, we're, we're not yet publishing. We're not even yet writing our manuscript. We're working on collecting information, discovering information, um, running our lab uh, experiments, our simulations, collecting data, analyzing the information, charting it, and so forth. And in that process, inevitably, we find researchers tell us that they want to be able to give attribution to others during that process. And the way that's done in artifacts is from this workspace view, where it is possible to click on given attribution. And what we see displayed here in this display, there are further below, but there are four citations that have already been given. Now, what artifacts does is if I make an attribution to a, to a data set, for example, that Weifu and Iris from the IES group have produced and shared. When I give that data set an attribution, it records on their artifacts dashboard as a citation received, and it records on my dashboard as a citation given. So this is very real time, and it's, and it's, it's a very new concept, but one that we think is highly valuable because inherent in, in artifact citations is also the ability to add a reason or rationale for giving a citation. So now, if I cite the work of Weifu and Iris and provide reasons, they not only learn that they've been cited, it's great from one's ego to learn that you've been cited, but they can also learn why. Citations received and given appear in dashboards immediately. So vice versa, if uh, if Weifu and Iris were to cite some of my works, they would show up in my citations. So here, what we see is a total display of artifact citations, those that I've given and those that I've received. Here's where I mentioned earlier that the, this is where we illustrate the significance of authors adding their supporting evidence to their artifacts account and to their journal dashboard. Because by doing so, artifacts is able to generate this type, this type of chart. Now, as pretty as a chart may be, the value of this chart is these, this is an illustration of data sets, computer code, audio visual, other data that have been added and associated with a publication. And in doing so, these authors not only are exposing their work for discovery, so their work is discovered, but also exposing their work so it can receive citation. So this is the last slide uh, that I have in, uh, in, this, in this sequence of illustrations. And as the, that work is done, the journal dashboard is updated. So how artifacts helps Publishers enhance value and authority is by securing the integrity of data, linking research data that provides access, new access, and new value for publishers, reporting citations for impact, refreshing publications with new content, and of course, 
Artifacts is free for use by researchers and authors that create these works, which enables the publisher to offer a service. So with that, let me conclude my, uh, my opening remarks and uh, for the moment, leave this slide to show contact information for myself and our uh, Director of Community uh, Engagement, uh, Emma Boswell. So with that, uh, Wei Fu, I'll, I'll turn it back to you to see if we have, uh, if we have some questions that have surfaced. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dave, for the sharing. Uh, for some of you who are joining the session late, uh, you're welcome to actually place the question or enter the question in the Q&A toolbar, which is right at the bottom center of your Zoom interface. Uh, Dave, thanks for sharing. And um, if I understand correctly, what you is doing is that you're creating a platform that allows researchers to start sharing their uh, evidences outcome of the research prior to publication and uh, pretty much also at the same time can start uh, citing each other's with your peers and so on. Is that correct? That, that's exactly correct, yes. Great. But you know, a lot of us, uh, our researchers in Asia, they care a lot about ISI and Scopus citation. I, I'm not very sure that, do you think that is anything related to that? Or you, do you think that such an early sharing of the data or evidences could help to improve their visibility or anything like that? What's your thought of that? Sure, oh great, great question. So let me take that in a couple of parts. Uh, first, mm -hmm. I, ab I absolutely believe, and I believe this because this is what researchers are saying to us. And particularly early stage, early career researchers, they may um, have yet to uh, successfully publish an, in an impactful journal um, that, they, that they view uh, intuitively, they view and consider the ability with the security of sharing their research findings in ways that enable the likelihood of them being discovered by others as well as then cited by others as valuable to valuable to their career, valuable to the their ability to successfully um, through that engagement find other collaborators, the ability to report citations to their work, interest and reuse of their of their research to funders, and ultimately uh, they're they're saying to us that those are step stones to uh, successfully um, receiving approval to publish in impactful journals. So yes, by, by, by sharing this information earlier, researchers are telling us that it's of great value to them uh, in their careers. Now, in terms of how Artifacts relates to the citation indexes uh, of Scopus, Web of Science, and so forth, um, we're, our, our intention is to be perfectly complementary. Uh, and, and, and we believe our focus on the pre-published or un, unpublished evidence of research is indeed complementary to the, to the indexing that organizations such as Clarivate uh, does with its web of science and Elsevier does with, uh, with, with, with Scopus. And what I mean by complementary is, I'll make this distinction. Um, we're all very familiar with altmetric, altmetrics as a generic term. And, and that's a wonderful innovation uh, in, in that it provides an early indication about published work, newly published works, uh, in terms of an indication of interest. And we all know that when a new article is published, as in impactful and relevant to our current research as it may be, we're still involved in our research. We need to complete our research. We need to write our manuscript. We may cite that, that published work, but it could be eight months later. It could be 14 months later. So it takes some time for every new publication to generate citation. Now that's where all metrics fills a bit of a gap because when a publication is released and disclosed, 
it's a, it's a very useful indication of interest, but it's not a formal, it doesn't generate formal citations. And so what Artifacts does is it generates formal citations earlier in the process, pre-publication, that we believe is a, a perfect complement and segue to formal citations as they appear in indexes such as Scopus and Web of Science. Right. So I guess this is something that researchers should do, keep engaging even their paper have been published and so waiting for the very first citation. And from my experience, it could be take years to come, but there's a lot of things can be done, even with your data, your artifact and so on. Is that right? That, that's absolutely right. And one of the first things that, that scientists and scholars want to do once they find, once they read an article, that is directly related to their own work is they want to be able to reach through that article to the creators, okay. but also to the data that they have produced. Under what conditions, what methodologies, um, very specific information that is at a level of detail that only exists. That's not what, that's not what a published article is intended to convey, but to reuse reuse, to try to replicate research, to try to validate research. Um, it's necessary to go into the, into the, the depth of the detail uh, of, of the research evidence that's produced. And as we all know, publishers in the, tip, in the conventional publishing model are generally not publishing negative results. And there are good reasons for that. However, if if those of us on this call are collaborating on a research project in, in exactly the same area that another team is, yet we don't know of that team's existence, we don't know that they're working on the same thing we are, and if they end up proving that their approach, learning that their approach failed, and if our approach is exactly the same, we would greatly benefit by knowing that information in advance. So there's a role for gaining access to research data of all types, even if it never culminates or results in a publication. Good. Well, I have two questions actually from the audience. One question is that um, I think one audience is having a concern that who owned the copyright of those uh, so-called research data or artifacts. I guess uh, if from the experience that when they publish a paper, the copyright usually is owned by the publishers. So what is your thought of this? Sure. So it's a, that is a, uh, it's a very astute question. And it is one that is widely debated uh, in the research community. And it's hotly debated, honestly. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, from an artifacts perspective, um, we are never the owner of the data. The, 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 the creators of the data and or the parties who obtain ownership rights of, over the data are the ones that continue to control ownership. And there are, there are various scenarios and situations where the funding organization mandates ownership over data not the publication, but the research data. Uh, the, the institution, the university or the research institute itself claims domain over the research data. And of course, both scientists and scholars that produce it are right in that debate, arguing sometimes successfully, sometimes not successfully, that they actually are and should continue to be the owners, or at least the parties to determine when that transfer of ownership occurs. So from an artifacts perspective, we never take ownership in data. Um, it's never required that the data actually reside on our servers. Um, we provide server uh, capacity as a matter of convenience, uh, but we must and we do adhere to the ownership of the data as it is represented to us by the parties who are using artifacts um, both as researchers and the organization that, that, subscribe, uh, that subscribe to a service. 
Right. In fact, we see that in the recent years, uh, a few universities, they have their so-called data repository in their institutional repository. So they okay. recite those data over there. So how Artifact could work with these people, helping, you know, those data can be more trackable and, and uh, you know, like what you say early on, to be more manageable. Yes, exactly. So the, the uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great example of um, institutional repositories, highly valuable, uh, but they're not as valuable today as, as they have the potential to be. And there are many reasons for that. Um, but one, one reason is that researchers are busy doing their science, doing their scholarship. And I've heard some on more than one occasion say, I, I, Dave, I just, I really don't have the time. I, I can't be bothered uh, by uploading my data on, into our repository. I know my university, I know my institution wants it. I know my funder wants me to post these data, but gosh, I, I'm right in the middle of this experiment and these experiments and I'm, and, and I'm also, applying for other grants. I don't have time to do this. Well, the beauty uh, of Artifact is that we develop connectivity, interoperability with institutional repositories, where, again, based upon the, the data policies and practices of the institution, um, we ensure that the research outputs, the work products, the data files that the researchers from that organization enter uh, the metadata for into artifacts at the appropriate time that information is transferred and uploaded uh, into the institutional repository. So we're a, if you will, be, we become a bit of a service agent or service bureau for the institution itself uh, and, and help everyone do, help everyone involved in creating these research uh, work product to be able to focus on what they really want to do while we handle some of that activity in the background. Right. If I want audience right now is asking a question that like, what are the platform that Artifact is using uh, for, for such a uh, work? Are you able to like show us some example or are you able to show some live that you can, you know, demonstrate how to do oh, that? Sure. Yeah. Yes. I'm, yes. I'm happy to. And it's great that we have a little bit of time. So let me, um, let me see, uh, let me end show. And I think I'm still screen sharing, yes. So let me move, let me move this out of the way. I anticipated that we might want uh, to take a look at the system. So this is great, great opportunity. So let me, Weifu, what I'll do is, I'll show a few things. Um, certainly, um, if there are additional questions that, that come up as, as I'm showing some of this, uh, some, some of the live system, uh, please weigh in and, and, and interrupt. Otherwise, I'll just continue, uh, I'll continue on for just a bit and then I'll pause. Yeah. So, so let me first, uh, I'll first start with, with our homepage. Um, it's a website. Uh, many of you may have already seen it. I'm actually going to, so there's, there's a great deal of information here that, that you can rely on uh, at artifacts.ai uh, to, to learn more about us. Um, I'm going to particularly come back to, to this uh, display here once I've shown you from within the system, because this is a convenient way, a very convenient way for any user to even just test out using artifacts to secure a proof of existence. And if you're a routine, or a routine user, you can use this at any point without even having to log into the system. So uh, logging into the system. Well, it's possible to create an account. Uh, it's very customary login protocols um, uh, that, that all of us are familiar with. I think a very important one and the three, the three login credentials here that we actively support are Orchid, uh, Google, and, and LinkedIn. Um, I, I think it's worth mentioning, uh, going out of my way to mention the collaboration that we have with, with ORCID. So not only can, can you, you sign in using your ORCID credentials, but Artifacts has, has fully implemented all of the API integration that ORCID has to offer, including full synchronization. Now what full synchronization means in this case is myself, I have an ORCID account, 
I have an artifacts account. I may, uh, there, a publication may surface that um, I want reflected in my, in my ORCID works file. And I update, I decide uh, to update my ORCID works file. Well, the synchronization with artifacts is such that if I've done that over an ORCID, it automatically synchronizes and updates my artifact record for that, for that, same, for that same artifact, or that, in that case, a publication. It could have been a data set, it could have been something else, but vice versa. As I'm adding content into, uh, into my artifacts, I can choose the option for full synchronization. I can also choose the option to, syn to synchronize on demand or selectively. So it's just a wonderful uh, synergistic relationship that we have with ORCID, and I'm just very, very pleased to have that in place. So without further, um, without further words there, let's go into the, uh, into the welcome page that I showed earlier. Uh, and and we, can take, uh, we can take a look at the JDBA uh, dashboard, where here, now this is all live, so I can see the proofs of existence in this case, the cumulative proofs of existence uh, that have been recorded for all the content associated uh, that's been published by the British Blockchain Association Journal of the British Blockchain Association. It's possible for me, let's go in and look at one of these. Um, this I think is, that, is, is, is a publication. And so this is a detailed screen display of that, uh, of that publication. You can see that the, uh, the POE, as we refer to it, the proof of existence, was made on February 24th. Um, I just want to show you, uh, indeed, that there is a blockchain confirmation that the system reports back to, uh, to all uh, who view this. And this is a public dashboard now. So you all have access to this. Um, and I can also click in on that link that actually takes us to the very detailed technical record um, that exists, uh, that Blocksburg displays of this transaction as it's been recorded onto that, onto that blockchain ledger. And it's probably worth just describing, defining what, again, what we mean by ledger. It's, the blockchain is very much like an accounting ledger. It's where entries come onto the system. Just as in accounting, debits and credits come into the system. The Blocksburg Ledger is it's operated by Max Planck and, and a group of consortium institutions, manages this ledger in such a way that it's essentially become the science, the blockchain for science ledger. So going back to this view, I can show the full information here. Uh, we can always get to the journal website. Uh, we can see the authors uh, of this of this work, the abstract keywords, and so forth. So what we've what we've done here is we've dived into a view of of the JBBA dashboard and a detailed record. But let me come back to this dashboard and show some of these more refined views, where again, what Artifacts is doing is taking in all the data from the publisher, from the authors, and redisplaying it. So it's possible to see the articles published by category, in this case, peer review research. I can call up a list of those and we can see these works. Um, these categories are very much customized to the nature of the, of the publisher's editorial practices. So in this case, it would be complementary uh, or commentary, excuse me, editorial, analysis, essay, and so forth. And we have these other similar views, author affiliation, and uh, one of the authors from Spain, 21 from the UK, a number from Australia. Let's see what we have from Japan, okay? A keyword display. Again, these are common and customary displays, but here's the illustration that I showed you earlier. And here's where Artifacts is very much reliant on upon, upon the authors to add their supplementary work files. And as they do so, we will update this display so that the 22 artifacts, in this case, that are code, computer code, or excuse me, no, these are data sets in this, in this blue purple, 
um, so that these become referenceable and citable work products for, for this creator Dyson. And when researchers, colleagues find these works and cite them, again, his personal dashboard or her personal dashboard are incremented just as the counts of citations for this publisher dashboard are updated. So that's just a quick mm -hmm. view of the publisher dashboard. Before I segue and look at um, how content comes into the system and the workspaces, let me just pause briefly, see Weifu if there are any questions that have surfaced in the interim. No, I think that's kind of good um, because uh, today we are not here to go to the entire uh, the platform, but I think this is definitely very helpful to showcase to the audience how exactly it looks like. And I think uh, Artifact been working very closely with some uh, consortium like Prosper and also the publisher like JBBA. In, in one or two sentences, uh, Dave, what, what, what is the uh, experience or feedback looks like? What what you hear from them ah, after uh, this survey? Yeah. Yes. So feedback. So feedback from publishers is that finally they have a way of adding incremental value to their publication that's unique, that's not available elsewhere, mm -hmm. that they haven't found elsewhere, and frankly doesn't exist. Where they're able to offer a service to their authors that benefits the authors by giving by enabling those those authors. The, the ability uh, to enhance how discoverable they are, and at the same time, benefits the journal, the publisher, by adding value and content and bringing more readership and readership that spends more time with the journal's publications or the publisher's works than they have before. Now, those are these are early days. Um, these are early indications, but that's some of the that's some of the early feedback that we've received thus far. Good. Well, thanks a lot, Dave. And to all the audience, I know this is something quite a new concept to most of you. Uh, but again, I think you, you guys heard a lot from uh, uh, from Crossref, from IES in the past, that talking about the importance of uh, research visibility, even before and after your publication. And you can hear today the sharing from Dave. There's a lot of things we can do, even with your data, your artifact, and some other evidence of research. And again, it could be done promoting it before or even after your publication. So uh, I think for the interest of time, I just want to remind all of you, the audience, yeah, welcome to write to us to ask for more questions and uh, even asking for some uh, demo. Or if necessary, we can provide you some guidance or training how to sign up to the uh, blockchain services. Uh, we're happy to do that. And uh, that will probably give you a lot more uh, ideas how to work on this uh, whole new technology and platform. And for those who actually need a certificate for this series of uh, webinar, uh, we will actually will issue a certificate, uh, so-called e-certificate to participants who join all the six sections. So there will be one more session for tomorrow, which is called how to improve journal visibility and data quality via research outreach. So it's going to be uh, presented by uh, a power blogger. Uh, his name is Casey Tang. He's been uh, around three to five years experience in uh, power blogging, particularly sharing science to the community. So uh, I welcome you guys to register. I will start exactly at 10 a.m. Malaysia time or 9 a.m. Indonesia time. So uh, till then, have a pleasant day ahead and always stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dave. Uh, staying in late, talking, sharing with us. Thank you. Great, Yeah, greatly appreciate it. Goodbye, folks. Thanks for attending. Bye.